Hey, um, so here we are again. I hope things have um, gone well so far. Um, so I want to start by going through an essay. In order to know where we're going, we've got to look at the map. And so this is a student sample from one of my classes. Um, this is Rudy. She wrote it about two, three years ago, I think. We'll see. Um, but anyway, this is looking at, of course, her final. She went through all the steps to get there, so it didn't start out this way. Um, but I want to talk about the sample, so we just look at it and see what are the components of this research paper, how does it come together, and then um, look at your first assignment for the research paper. So let's take a look. Now, um, I'm doing this video, but if you want to read the full text of this paper, it is on the schedule here, so you can click there and open it up and take a look at it. So here we go. One of the first things to notice is the format, and we are doing our research paper in APA format, and we'll talk more about that and study that, of course, as we go on. So if you haven't done it before, don't worry about it, um, but just take a look at it. Get used to looking at the format so that whenever you look at how it's laid out, you can identify it, and of course, as you look at samples, you want to look at your own and make sure that in terms of format, layout, and structure, it looks like this. Now, Rudy's paper is quite substantial, and I may not read through the whole thing. Um, and it's um, from a time when I um, required a little longer paper. So that's um, kind of a nice um, thing there. I just want to get to the end here so I can go back and forth between these two copies and we can look at them. One of the things you will notice at the end of every research paper is a page that has the bibliography, your references, your sources, what you used in that paper, and that's very key. So let's go ahead and start um, by taking a look at Rudy's paper. So we're looking at really one example of how to do this, and we'll look at a couple more as we go through the semester, and you want to come back to these. Um, one of the things about um, this kind of writing, this formal writing we're doing, is this is not a kind of writing we speak in. So the voice is very different. I want you to notice that there are not, Rudy does have technical words in here because she's writing about a technical subject, but her other words it's not big words just for the sake of big words. They're big words when they're the technically correct one. If a two-letter word does as good or better a job, better of a job than a larger one, use the simple one. You're talking about complex ideas, and so you don't want to obfuscate it, cover it up with big words. Um, so one of their couple of keys to this kind of voice in writing, and that's what I want to show you as you go through here, as we go through here. So let me just get into it. I tend to Put it off. All right, so her paper is called Dying to be Beautiful, The Effects of Media on Women and Young Girls, Rudy Pennington. Oh, I'm sorry, hers isn't very technical. I was thinking of another student that we'll look at later. Um, and she has an abstract, and this abstract is just a summary of your paper. You write it after you're done, and it is very um, straightforward. This paper discusses current media attitudes are examined. These images range from, range from. So as we get to the end stages where you are putting an abstract together, remember you do it after you write your paper, because only then can you really summarize what you said. And it is very much this kind of thing that says, here's what's in this paper. You know, it discusses, it looks at, um, these points are made. So it's very much a kind of heavy-handed kind of writing. You'll see it's very different from what happens in the paper. Now, I am teaching you general writing. When you go into your field, you will learn the specifics of that voice and style. Um, and as you read more, as you get more into your classes that are focused on your field, um, you want to pay attention to that. So I'm teaching you general writing that will work for any kind of formal situation. Um, then as you become more specialized, you will want to pay attention to the voice there. So um, that abstract has some keywords, and again, we'll study um, this. So here we go. Dying to be beautiful. The effects of media on young women, on women and young girls. In this economy that evolves around consumerism, marketing products to the masses through popular media is a dependable method to assure sales. However, marketers are not only selling products through advertisements, they are selling ideas. One set of ideas in particular is the Anglo-centric standards of beauty that are dominating Western culture. According to the experts in the field, the image of women in advertising today is worse than ever. 
The pressure on women to be thin, young, and beautiful is more intense than ever. Ultimately, this has led to an increase in body image negativity, low self-esteem, and eating disorders in women and girls as young as 8 years old. Understandably, men are just as susceptible to the effects of advertisements. However, research shows that women spend more time and money on beauty and are at an exponentially greater risk for anorexia and bulimia. The image of women in advertising today portrays an unrealistic and unattainable standard of beauty that is both physically and psychologically detrimental to the well-being of women and young girls. So that's her first paragraph. She gets us in it. And here's one of the key things about your first paragraph in almost any kind of essay, but definitely in a very formal essay, is you, of course, start with this big idea. She um, starts talking about um, the economy and consumerism, marketers selling products, advertising, um, what it's led to. So she's starting with the big ideas. And then she's going to go to her thesis. And in your formal papers, when you're writing for teachers, you want to, in general, like I said, as you go into your field, you'll see this done different ways. But for the general paper, you want to end your introduction, and actually even in some of your most specialized ones, with your thesis. What is your main point? Now, one of the first things we're doing in this, es um, this essay sequence is you're sending me some topic questions. Rudy's main point came from her topic question. She asked the question. She did the research. And then I said, hey, Rudy, what's your answer? Her answer then becomes her thesis, her main point, which she's going to put at the end of, of the introduction. That's the exact same process I expect you to do um, in that. So this last sentence here, this one right here that says, um, the image of, of women in advertising today portrays an unrealistic and unattainable standard of beauty that is both physically and psychologically detrimental to the well-being of women and young girls. All this is, is Rudy started with a question to research and find out about. She did her research. That's her answer. What that does is it sets up readers in the rest of the paper. We're like, okay, Rudy, cool. You know so much. Explain to us how you arrived at this conclusion. So the rest of your paper simply becomes this um, sort of story of how you arrived at that. What did you read? What did you find out? Who did you talk to? Those kinds of things. That's the research that goes in there to explain why you believe what you believe about it in the end. So that's the kind of crux of the first paragraph, that introduction. Big topic, move people into it, and then give that thesis. What is your main point? And here, since we're starting with a question, and even if a teacher doesn't give you a question, they give you a topic. If you turn it into a question, then you just answer that question after you've done your research, pop that in at the end of your introduction, and it lays it out. It lays out, you know what you need to talk about. It's what that answer is. How did you get to that? And then it also directs readers toward it. So the next thing Rudy's going to do is she's going to talk about a little history or background. And this isn't appropriate to all essays. It depends on your topic. But it often is. Um, um, she's going to talk about kind of what we know. So she says, it has been said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But there are also, there's also scientific validity that supports how humans and other species perceive and judge beauty. According to Feng an undergraduate of human biology at Stanford University, symmetry has been scientifically proven to be inherently attractive to the human eye. Feng's peer-reviewed science journal article, Looking Good, The Psychology of Bio and Biology of Beauty, cites multiple experiments that test the theory of symmetric beauty. For example, Victor Johnson, a professor of psychology at New Mexico State University, created a survey in which viewers would rate a series of facial images on a beauty scale of 1 to 9. The photos with the highest ratings were all symmetric. Fang and Howard, the senior science editor of Huffington Post, both report that humors, humans are not the only species that seeks out beauty and symmetry. According to scientists, female swallows, for example, prefer males with longer and more symmetric tails, while female zebra finches mate with males with symmetrically colored leg bands. 
In Howard's YouTube video, The Science of Female Attractiveness, some research suggests that during mating season, male and female flamingos will apply natural oil on themselves to attract the opposite sex by bringing out the pink of their feathers. Howard parallels this to the act of applying cosmetics to appeal more appealing to the topic opposite sex. Moreover, Fang's research states that the, ra the rationale behind symmetry preference in both humans and animals is the symmetric individuals that symmetric individuals have a higher male mate value. Scientists believe this symmetry is equated with a strong immune system. Thus, beauty is indicative of more robust genes, improving the likelihood that an individual's offspring will survive. Although there is sound scientific proof that justifies our perceptions of beauty, something in history caused modern society to change its definition of beauty. So, what's going on here? Well, she's of course giving us this kind of how do we define beauty or what do we know about what makes animals see things as beautiful. Um, but notice, think about that voice. Again, Rudy didn't speak like this. She talks just like people do. Um, and so this does, this is more formal, but there are some things I want you to think about in terms of what makes this sound more formal. Now, Rudy never says, in doing research, I, even that's a little more formal, but I think, in my opinion, um, I found a paper that says, get rid of I, me, mine. In formal writing, you want to get rid of it. You may find in your field, there are some fields where they do that, and that's okay there. But again, I'm teaching you to write for just kind of anyone in general, um, because we don't have writing classes just for people in this field or getting this degree, whatever it is. So as you go into your field, you'll be looking at that. But here, get rid of the I, me, my. So these formal papers do not do that. Most of the time, you can just drop it in the sentence, fine. I think that symmetry is important. Symmetry is important. All of a sudden, that sounds more formal. It sounds more assertive, more uh, bold. And this is a bold kind of writing. Um, there is no you. Oh, dude, get rid of the yous. No yous. Who do you mean? Um, if she says, um, you may be attracted to someone with more symmetry. Does she just mean you? Me? Just the person who's reading it? No, what she means is we, us, our. I'm okay with the collective. So if we're talking about people in general, we can see that. say that. Um, if she's talking about zebra finches, she's going to say zebra finches. If you're talking about te um, teachers or consumers or readers, whoever you are, when you find a you in your paper that you wrote, if it's in a quote, that's okay. If the eyes are in a quote, that's okay. But in your text, the parts you're writing, with that you, when you find that and you look through it for it, it will be one of the final things you do as you're doing your final proofreading. Ask, who do I really mean? And substitute that word in there. So, no I, me, my, no you. So, we get rid of those personal pronouns and all of a sudden, it sounds more formal. Now, the other thing she did is she's obviously integrating research. This isn't just, here, here's what I think, you know, makes people attractive or beautiful or whatever. She's saying, we know, based on science, just even down to our animal nature, how this works to some extent. And so let's look at what she does here. Um, she is, we're, again, we're using APA, and any kind of citation style does two things. One is it uses signal phrases, so this according to, um, that kind of thing. Let's see. Um, Fang and Howard both report that. These kinds of things are very important. So we're using our words as clues whenever we give information. We're also doing this. Now this is APA, and APA really values dates, so it puts them right after that. And we'll study the citation, of course, over the next few weeks, so I'm not going to go in depth here because you'll get that later. But that is also part of it. But did you notice that she's only using the author's last names? There's Fang, there's Fang and Howard. Um, she goes on um, later, of course, we'll see um, more um, sources. And in APA, whenever we use an author's name, we only use their last name. No Mr., no Ms., no Doctor. You want to say somebody's a doctor? You would say Fang, a doctor of psychology. 
makes your paper longer, we put it in our words. And we only need to say that in the very beginning. Um, or, you know, so-and-so, a senior editor at wherever. So she's giving the author's name, only last names. And this is the way we do it in APA. Um, so that's expected not to do it as disrespectful. Um, to call an author by their first name is hugely disrespectful. Don't ever do that. Um, and so we do those last names. We also give credibility. You notice that she says, you know, like, um, you know, one person at New Mexico State University. So she's always letting us know, wait, I have these sources, but let me tell you why this person's worth listening to. And so that attribution is very important. And then the other thing, check this out, whenever she uses um, quotes. So, for example, here, um, and here she's, you know, set up that this is according to Fang and Howard, so we know where it's coming from. She says, according to science, scientists, female swallows, for example, prefer males. And she goes on with that quote. Notice how this quote, according to scientists, boom, the quote starts here, female swallows, for example, prefer males. Notice how this quote is integrated into her sentence. That is the third key thing that will make you sound more formal. So first of all, get rid of those personal pronouns, the I, me, my, you, your. Get rid of those. Second of all, make sure you use author's names, sources names. If you don't have an author, then if we're quoting something from the college website, there's not a name for who wrote it, then EPCC is the author. So we do have an author. It's the organization. Um, and of course, we'll look at that too. But we use our sources. We make sure people know where our sources are from, and we use those signal phrases and the citation in there. Um, and the other thing is that integration of those quotes into our sentences. Those three things, if you do those three things, it will make you sound smarter than you are. I already know you're smart. They make me sound smarter than I am. I can sound smart in fields I know very little about because I know how to write about it and get that voice. So you notice that she hasn't used any big crazy words. I mean, really, these are really straightforward words. So it's not about big words. When you need technical ones, you use those, and those are the right ones. Um, it's about that kind of voice, you know, those personal pronouns, and using that attribution and giving credibility. That is the key to and integrating those quotes into your sentences. You do those three things, that is the key to formal voice. So, oh, lovely. I spent that whole thing with this yellow spot on my nose. Let's go back to the paper. All right, so in this, what she does is, of course, she sets this up. She found this research, and she shares it with us. So now we have this idea of kind of, you know, why is there this kind of beauty standard? Um, but now she's going to give us some history. Examples of great beauties are recorded throughout history, but so are the serious implications and perceptions of beauty. And you'll notice when you look at her paper, she has this very clear topic sentences at the first of all of her body paragraphs. She is telling us, here's what I'm talking about, and that's key. So, in ancient Greece, Helen of Troy, a very beautiful Spartan queen who was celebrated in time for physical perfection is said to have caused the Trojan War. In med medieval times, Guinevere, the beautiful wife of King Arthur, is said to have caused the downfall of Camelot because of an adulterous affair she had with Arthur's chief knight, Sir Lancelot. In more recent history, skin color plays a major role in society's concept of beauty. Colorism which is defined as the discrimination against individuals with a dark skin tone in the African-American community, originated during the 1800s when slavery was prominent. In the article, Dark Skin versus Light Skin, The Battle of Colorism in the Black Community, Campbell, a journalist for Odyssey, explains that the animosity that existed and still exists between dark-skinned and light-skinned individuals started because slaves with lighter skin were shown preferential treatment by their slave owners and were granted certain privileges, such as working and living in the house, as opposed to working in the field and living in the far less desirable slave quarters. Even after the abolition of slavery in the United States, educational institutions, clubs, and other organizations 
within the African American community would determine who was worthy of attending college or being granted access by, to exclusive clubs by administering the paper bag test. This was done by comparing skin color to a brown paper bag. Anything darker than the bag was deemed unattractive. Unfortunately, this test is still perpetuated over social media today. The lighter skin color is still a modern definition of beauty. At the turn of the century, feminism was on the rise, advocating for the empowerment of women and challenging of traditional gender roles. When Victorian dresses went out of style and the Roaring Twenties brought the hemlines of the flap up, the hemlines of the flappers, according to the article, 100 years of shaving ads show how we've been tricked into going hairless by Comar, a writer who specializes in body positivity, a lot more seemingly innocent hair was exposed. And with that, an idea of a new problem arose. The answer to that problem would be the Lady Razor, which was invented in 1915 by Gillette. In 1922, women's magazines began to run hair removal ads exploiting women's fears and insecurities. From this point in time to the present, women were forced to believe that being hairless was synonymous with beauty and femininity. Aggressive marketing aimed at women has cultivate, culminated since the 1930s, and now advertisements are extremely su sexually suggestive and put forward the notion that women should make their body um, as attractive for a man as possible. So here she's given us some history, kind of where did this come from and where did it evolve? And so again, she's used sources um, and she's shown us where those go. Now, one of the other things that's key to a formal paper is having that, we have these little shortcuts in the paper where she's given us the name and because this is APA, she's given us the date. She hasn't used anything with a page number yet, but if she does, she'd put in the page number where she read it. Um, but the other thing is with formal papers, we always have that list at the end. So that should have that in there. Whatever you use in your paper, you need to acknowledge by saying so-and-so said this in this video, in this article. You need to make sure people know where it came from. And then at the end, you're going to have your list of sources that will cite that. Whatever's in your paper should be listed on your, your, your um, source page. Whatever's on your source page, anybody should be able to find in your paper. Let's look at Rudy's real quick. Um, here's Rudy's source page. Let me make this a little bigger. And we've already looked at some of these, right? We've already seen Fang. She's already mentioned Howard. She's already mentioned Komar. She's already mentioned... Oh, I thought there was another one. Not yet. Um, but um, all of these are listed on this page. And all these do, these citations, just are a formal way of saying, here's where you go find the information. And that's one of the things to think about with your research paper. This is a conversation with your reader. Rudy's telling us, here's how I, you know, see this. This is what made me believe in this point I'm making. I read this and I read that. But she's also doing, notice here, like, um, here the other thing she's doing is interpreting. Because she gave us all this information. And then she says, what does this mean? What does this show? Um, so, you know, that it's it's done this and that's what it's, um, the, way it, the way it has an effect on us in this one. Um, Although there is sound science proof, scientific proof that justifies our perceptions of beauty, something in history caused modern society to change. And that's where she goes into that, that history. So um, what's happening in these body paragraphs is twofold. One, well, threefold, I would say, one, she has a clear topic sentence. Embrace those, love those, make those your friends. You can write the paragraph, and then once you're done, you look at it and say, does this first sentence really say what this is all about? If it does, good job, pat on the back. If not, you write a sentence that introduces that paragraph, put it in there, and then give yourself the pat on the back. Um, but the other thing is it introduces, okay, I'm making a point. Boom, let me share my research, what I found with you. But then you've also got to say what you think. It is easy sometimes in doing research to think all these teachers want to hear is what other people think. The only time you do that is if they say, summarize, only summarize. If they say that, take it seriously and only summarize. You're just saying, here's what this writing, this author, this text says. That's it. 99% of the time, your writing will ask you to summarize. 
and then interpret, reflect, analyze, make your point. And that's what a research paper does. It says, here's the, here's the source, here's what it shows us, what it means, how it plays a role, whatever it, your topic is, you're explaining, you're analyzing, you're interpreting it. So you always want to make sure these body part paragraphs will almost always end not with, don't end with a quote, because the paper is about what do you think. Writing a paper is um, a great compliment, even though sometimes we'd rather have a test. You know, smart fourth, fifth, sixth graders could memorize most of what we have to memorize in college if they're dedicated and smart. Um, doing the critical thinking, not so much. And so when someone asks you to write a paper, they're saying, hey, I don't want to just know that you know facts. I want to know what you think. Um, so it may be more of a pain in the ass. It may be something you love. Either way, the point is, when a teacher asks you to write a paper, one, they're putting themselves up for more work. It's a lot easier to run a test through a Scantron machine. And two, they're saying, what do you think? And so you want to make sure that, yes, you have research in there, but that you are interpreting it. You're making sense of it. And so those components, that kind of clear topic sentence, that sharing that research that has to do with what you're talking about in that moment, and then making sure you explain it is very key. Once in a while, we may have a paragraph that ends with a quote. And if that happens, usually it's because there's going to be a longer explanation from the writer, from you, um, after that, to talk about what does this mean, how does it fit in, what does it show us, any of those questions. Um, all right, so <clears throat> let's move on a little bit. So she's given us kind of scientifically where we get our ideas of beauty. She's given us historically where some of that's come from. And then she's going to talk about today. Because of tools like Photoshop, women are constantly faced with unrealistic and unattainable beauty standards. Thus, according to experts like Kilborn, the image of women in advertising is worse than it has ever been. Kilborn, who is internationally recognized for her groundbreaking work on women in advertising, states in her lecture, The Dangerous Way Ads Seeing Women, that the obsession with thinness is worse than ever because of programs like Photoshop. One striking image in her lecture features a model that was digitally, digitally altered to be skinny, so skinny that her head was larger than her pelvis. This, Kilburn states, is an anatomical, ana anatomical impossibility. Another expert in this field, England, who is a psychologist and body image researcher at Northwestern University, has coined the term beauty sickness, which is defined as an obsession with appearance, a persistent lack of self-satisfaction with body image, and a strong and relentless drive to achieve beauty, and is defined by American society. In her lecture, An Epidemic of Beauty Sickness, England states that it is impossible to engage with the world while chronically monitoring one's body appearance. When you are beauty sick, you cannot engage with the world because when between you and the world is a mirror, and it's a mirror that travels with you everywhere. You can't seem to put it down. Besides the altering of body size, Photoshop has been used to lighten skin tone of people of color. Kilburn states that after displaying another photo example of a woman's vaginal area that was cut off to accentuate the dreaded thigh gap, that the images of advertisements construct are impossible standards for everyone and anyone to achieve. But they are particularly impossible for women of color, who are considered beautiful only in so far as they resemble the white ideal light skin, straight hair, Caucasian features, and round eyes. As a result, some people of color have resorted to toxic skin bleaching creams to lighten their skin and ultimately remove the melanin. They do, they do this to fit into society's definition of beauty, no matter the cost to their health. And you can see here, here she's given information, but she didn't use the author's name in her sentence. So once in a while we'll do that, but generally we're going to put it in the sentence. And we'll study, of course, kind of times to decide when to do that. The argument that women are not smart enough, smart enough not to be affected by images in the media is brought up constantly and has been proven valid. But it does not change the fact that most women who see these unrealistic images feel negatively toward their own bodies. So again, you can see she's sharing evidence, and then she's saying, look, here's what it shows us. This is what we see through this. Um, 
I'm not going to go through all the rest of the paragraphs. Again, if you want to read it, it's on the syllabus, and I will put a link in the description in this video. Um, but you can see what I want you to walk away from this with is not understanding how to do the whole thing. We've got a semester, okay? And if we could do it that fast, we'd take the test, and we'd be done by now. Um, so, but it's just kind of this structure and really learning that you need to read this kind of writing and read it out loud. Go read Rudy's essay out loud. Go look at on um, the, um, on my, um, on kelly.ninja. If you go to the 1302 research page and you look down here, you'll see that, oh wait, let me refresh. I know I uploaded these the other day. Oh, there they are. You'll see, here's Rudy's, um, essay. There's also two other essays. There are um, essays in our um, writer's reference. You can find other research essays online. If you're having trouble with this voice, how this sounds, remember it's not about big words unless there are technical things in the topic you're writing about, and you'll learn those as you study it. Um, but it's about that getting rid of those pronouns, integrating those sources. If you really want to learn it, you want to make it easier for yourself. You want it to come more naturally in writing. Read them and read them out loud. Have someone read them to you. Cat, dog, read them to your cat, your dog, your love of your life, or like I said last time, your enemies. Um, you know, drive them nuts. But reading this out loud will help you get this voice more. Um, so these components all go into it. And let me just kind of move on down. She talks about... Um, just some crazy things. Um, of course, she's talk gives information from the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders. Um, you'll see places where she's doing different things with citation, which again we'll study. Um, she talks about kind of um, contemporary culture, so she talks about Fifty Shades of Grey. She uses um, a Lily Allen song in here and talks about what she says. Skinny body challenges, so she talks about social media and how, um, and there's some crazy things there. I was just like floored. Um, she talks about, you know, kind of the effects that that has. And then, um, then here's where she uses Lily Allen's song and talks about, you know, how there are, there's commentary on this and, and people talking about it. Um, and then she's going to bring it all together. And in the end, this conclusion is not just in a conclusion you don't want to put, um, just here's what I said. This is formal writing for smart readers. Think of writing, don't just think about writing you this paper to me. Instead, think of every teacher you've have, ever had reading over my shoulder. Because if you're just writing for Kelly, you got to take away at the end of the semester and learn to write overall. So think about just writing for teachers in general, professors, especially as you're moving up. Think about those at the level you're working on. Um, so in your conclusion, I don't want to just say that here's what I said. You can do a little bit of that. Summarize it. That's okay. But you want to dig deeper. What does it mean overall? What's the big deal? Why does this matter? And that's where um, you want to do that deep thinking. Really, you want to write your paper, at least the body of it, and generally in the end I'll suggest that you just kind of set that aside once you do that and just say, so what? That's what every conclusion should be is, I told you all this stuff, so what? Why does it matter? Why is it important? How does it help us? So let's look at Rudy's. When it comes to the argument regarding the image of women in advertising, some will argue advertisements and marketing that feature an artificially constructed image of the human form cause more harm to the psyche than they do good. Others will argue that the innovation of marketing revolutionized capitalism and consumerism and is vital to our way of life. Yet others will choose not to argue at all and claim they are exempt from the influence of advertising. However, that is just not the case. Whether they are aware of it or not, the influence of advertising is quick, cumulative, and for the most part, subconscious. It is impossible to escape um, the influence of advertising. And moreover, the influence of advertising is having a very real, very dangerous effect on women and young girls who are exposed to them. Experts such as Elgin su suggest that to turn the tide against the effects of beauty sickness, sickness, society must invest less in beauty. This means that if watching shows like America's Next Top Model and reading magazines like Cosmo make people think more about their appearance, they should stop watching and reading them. Companies like Aerie, 
that have chosen to hire more racially diverse models and have ceased to use Photoshop to alter their images are paving the way toward creating a more positive body image in women of all ages. Hopefully this type of forward thinking will revolutionize the way women in advertising are portrayed in the future. So that's how she wraps it up. Let's go back to the introduction and see. Now we didn't read the whole thing, okay, um, but did she get this across? that the image of women in advertising today portrays an unrealistic and untainable standard of beauty that is both psychologically, physically and psychologically detrimental. And so we didn't read the whole essay, so we don't know all of that, but I can tell you she did, because she does talk about both the psychological and the physical when she talks about the social media challenges. Um, and that's the key thing, is it, you know, in the end, you know, what is the big deal? And of course, she's laid out how this is damaging and, and problematic. And, um, and we could write the same paper about men. Um, interesting, interestingly, well, sadly, too, um, it's only been in the last few years that, few, five, six, seven, that men have been begun to be diagnosed in more significant numbers with anorexia and bulimia. And it does correlate. That doesn't mean it's caused by, but there is a correlation between that and um, social media and just kind of more prevalence imagery and the internet, fitspiration, you know, I mean, you see all these six-pack abs and, the, you know, the guns and everything, and, and so it's this idea of, oh, that's what I should look like, and of course, there is nothing wrong with being healthy, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be bulked out, um, but whenever it becomes, you know, detrimental to one's well-being, then it is problematic. Um, so I, what I wanted you to really see is just kind of what this kind of writing is like. Now I've gone on too long here, so I'm going to end this video and then I'll do a short one um, on the um, your topic questions and um, that way it'll be real concise. But, um, you know, think about, come back, go read the whole video, I mean the whole essay as we go through this process. When you're fixing to sit down and write some of our assignments, um, the topic questions, the first one's very informal, but like our first pre-writings, we're working on doing this. Stop and go read a couple of paragraphs from a research paper. You know, one of the samples I have in the book, whatever, and just read it out loud. It'll help you get that feeling of that voice. And then when you sit down and write, write like that, remember, don't throw the big words in, just throw the big words in. It actually makes your writing worse. Now, that said, this is a place to play with vocabulary, so try it out. I'll, I'll let you know. That's my job. I'm the helper. Um, so anyway, um, like I said, I hope that gives you just kind of the overall view of that. And again, you can go to the research, 1302 research page, and there are these samples. We'll look at finding the zombie within ourselves. That one's a lot of fun. And um, just kind of keep those things in mind um, as we write. So um, all in all, that's pretty much it. And take care. We'll see you next time.